what do you do if, if the world looks like this and you, you're an investor or you're an American household and you're looking at a place to put your, your savings, what do you do? And increasingly, I've come to believe that cryptocurrency represents like a really smart place to spend time in. Welcome to Generational Arbitrage. I'm Tyler Neville, and I'm sitting down with one of my favorite real estate investors, Nick Hilaris of Metros Capital. Metros is an opportunistic investment development company. They specialize in living spaces like houses and apartments. They have holdings in projects in Los Angeles, San Diego, and Atlanta. They invest across the socioeconomic spectrum from anything from luxury to uh, good workforce apartments and, and family homes. So, Nick, welcome to Generational Arbitrage. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Tyler. I'm excited, excited to be here, excited about this, this new project of yours. I've enjoyed you know, following your work over the years and, and your newsletter at BlockWorks, and it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, man. So let's dig it. Let's let's hear about your background. I think uh, you told me a great story one time about when you were at Stanford. You you were uh, in a class um, taught by Peter Thiel. Can you can you brief us on that one? Yeah, sure. This is an interesting place to start this conversation, but I think it's a it's a it's a worthwhile story. So this was, gosh, this was 2004. I was in my third year at Stanford, and I had I'd already sort of made the determination that. I didn't really want to be a lawyer, despite you know spending three years at Stanford, which was really a privilege and an honor, but you know, it costs a lot of money and a lot of time for a young person. But so I made this determination, and you know, just so happens that Peter Thiel was just kind of exiting from PayPal at the time, and so he was a Stanford alum, and he taught this course that was like super broad and and super interesting, and I took it. And Peter was a really accessible guy, you know, he still kind of is, I think, and he had office hours. And so I started going to office hours just because I wanted to talk to him and hear about his experiences and stuff. And Peter gave me some interesting advice. He, he basically kind of validated my thought about not going, continuing on in law because he had sort of gone down that path before he started PayPal. Like he was mm -hmm. going down the path of clerkship and the law. And he's like, look, this is a fool's game. You're going to be 50 years old and basically be chained to your desk. And you'll be making money, but you you won't really be making as much as, as you could if you, you know, start a company like I did or even go to Wall Street and just earn bonuses, you know, mm -hmm. make it a few levels up the ranks and earn bonuses. And so he, he encouraged me that. And, and so I said, well, what do you think I should do? And uh, this is where I kind of screwed up because I, I took half of his advice and, and I never became a lawyer. But he kind of offered me an opportunity at the time. And, and I was too smart for this opportunity. He's like, you know, I just invested... Um, in this social media company called Facebook, <laughs> well, why don't you why don't you come on and work in, in sort of business development? And I was like, I don't want to work in social media. Like this is really my place. <laughs> kind of fun. And uh, I probably you know my career would have had a totally different trajectory because I would have been one of the, the very first you know real employees of that company. Oh, um, and yeah. I, I remember actually Peter had a party for the the class at his his place in San Francisco, and Zuckerberg is there. And this opportunity is right in front of me, and I, I didn't take it, but yeah. so be it. Yeah, yeah. You, you make your choices and live with it, but that, that yeah. would have been funny. You, you would have been a billionaire and, uh, you know, yeah. living on a beach somewhere. Not that exactly. you're not already in, uh, in LA, <laughs> but um, anyway, so I love reading your work. Uh, Nick writes a, a newsletter called Profit. It basically does the gamut from anything from real estate to investing to life advice, to philosophy and politics, which is, you know, all the stuff I'm interested in. Um, and why don't you just give us your framework of how you look at the world? And because it's really rare for a real estate investor to kind of see everything from like multi lenses. Yeah, sure. You know, over the years, I, I've always, my whole life, I've been interested in sort of the, the stock market and investing. And so, you know, as early as my teens, I'm, I'm reading books like Market Wizards and Intelligent Investor. And so I've had this desire, I think, from, from very early to be an investor. And in my 20s, I was kind of looking for the appropriate way to express that interest in, in the business world. And I also had this aligned interest or a, a similar interest in real estate. For some reason, I was always fascinated by architecture and design and just the way in which you 
consume the built environment. Like I, w- I always got excited when I went into architecturally unique places. And I had, I, I had this habit of sort of forecasting what life would be like inside of these spaces. And so when I finally got up the courage to, to get and do what I really wanted to do, which was kind of be an entrepreneur, you know, follow on the, the second path of Peter's advice, I got yeah. into real estate because it was, it was right around 2009 and 10. And real estate offered this incredible opportunity because of what had just happened in, in the housing crash. And like many real estate investors, I kind of dove into the weeds. What happens to real estate investors typically is you, you get very focused on the micro dynamics of individual transactions or strategies. And that's where most investors kind of stop. But that intellectually, that was never enough for me. And so I continued my journey and, and started you know, to, to seek out new kinds of thoughts and new ideas on how you could approach investing in real estate. And so kind of along a parallel path developed, you know, kind of a macroeconomic framework for, for looking at this. And, and I found it to be really valuable because what most real estate investors don't, don't realize when they're focused on these micro things is that the macro dynamics can come and kind of blow you up. And, you know, it happens... It happened more in the past when interest rates actually moved around. Mm-hmm. So interest rates yeah. you know, could, could ruin your deal if they went the wrong way, or they could ruin yeah. the whole industry like they did in the housing. Now, that hasn't happened in 10 years, but um, I found that having a perspective and an understanding of what's happening in the macro makes you better as a real estate investor. Yeah, so, so one of the things you said to me a couple months ago, maybe a year ago or so, was QE, people don't get the QE mechanism. Everyone thinks it's just an asset swap, but you're sitting front and center in an asset class, which is housing uh, and, and commercial real estate that you think is is the number one, I think, beneficiary. I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but can you talk about the, the mechanism of QE and how it really you know changes the game in real estate? Yeah, definitely. This kind of goes hand in hand with what I was just saying about how I, I, ha- I had to develop a macro understanding to be better at what I was doing because what happened to me is that I started this company and everything was going great and was able to buy a bunch of really sort of mispriced assets. The dynamics in these markets quickly changed as the policy of QE was um, kind of rolled out because of the flood of liquidity. And it really it very quickly changed the opportunity set and the dynamics of what I was looking at, which at the first kind of my first business was essentially buying foreclosed homes because that was sort of the the low hanging fruit in the market, all those homes that they overbuilt and whatnot. And Mm -hmm. that quickly got gobbled up by these institutions who are kind of making headlines again, who are doing this buy to rent strategy. Like there was a moment in time when we're buying foreclosures and all of a sudden Black uh, Blackstone and, and uh, Colony raised these funds and they literally bought everything. Every foreclosure that was at the auction, they bought them all. And so we literally got totally pushed out of that market. And that happened in maybe 2012. And I was like, wow. where did this come from? You know, yeah. looking back, I know exactly where it came from. Mm-hmm. And then uh, a similar thing happened with apartments. In Atlanta, we were buying foreclosed apartments for sort of pennies on the dollar. It was a phenomenal opportunity. And by 2014, 2015, flood of liquidity had turned its eyes towards that and uh, had gone, it went crazy. It's the same yeah. dynamic. And at the same time, I started thinking about QE and paying attention to the local dynamics and the markets like where I live here in LA and noticed that there was this like inflation narrative that was getting a lot of local attention, but not really getting picked up by the, the national story around QE. And affordability became sort of the hot topic issue of the day in Los Angeles and some of these other big cities because the price of housing, the price of rents had gone crazy, Mm -hmm. despite the fact that you had a national news cycle and the Fed talking about how there's no inflation. We're sitting here watching like 100 percent, like literally rents went up like 100 percent in the the time that I started investing. And so couldn't square those two, right? Like, okay, there's no inflation, but how come it's? 100% 100% more expensive to live in Los Angeles than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. I had the same uh, kind of experience when I lived in San Francisco for five years before moving to Austin. And it was like, yeah, no inflation, no inflation. And everywhere you went, the, the rents were just skyrocketing. And there was, I, it was partly no supply, obviously. 
but you can dig into yeah. to those dynamics a bit more. Yeah, so I came up with this theory over time. You know, it took me years to kind of come up with this, but my theory is that quantitative easing can transmit into the real economy. It doesn't always. And when it, like, for example, like I'll give you an example of a benign form of quantitative transmission is what I call it. Um, when, when, quant when the liquidity provided by quantitative easing ends up in the stock market, from the perspective of the ordinary American citizen and their standard of living, it's relatively benign because when money ends up going into buybacks or something like that, it doesn't incentivize the underlying companies to do anything to their price structure. They're not raising prices. It's really a financial kind of alchemy transaction. There's nothing to it. But that's not necessarily true of all forms of speculation. You know, quantitative easing, if you, if you go back to the inception of it, quantitative easing was about two things. It was about liquidity, sort of making sure that these markets would continue to function. And it was about the wealth effect. And Bernanke wrote this op-ed article in the Washington Post. And, you know, he, he, in academic speak, he talks about, hey, here's what we're trying to do, guys. We are going to encourage people to speculate hoping that this speculative activity will cause asset prices to go up, which will induce spending, and this spending will trickle down. So that's the logical flow. And the thing about it is it actually works. So we, we've mm -hmm. discovered that quantitative easing does induce this sort of wealth effect. It, it does stabilize markets, but it, it's not necessarily always benign when it comes to inflation. And real estate, where I've been living for the past 10 years, is, the, is literally the prime case, it's a prime example of it because speculative activity in real estate markets is pro-inflationary. When you buy real estate, you, you typically, you don't just buy it and hope that it goes up. You do something to it. You're trying to generate returns. And what that typically involves is you do some kind of capital improvement or you just raise the rent if you have that ability. And so the end result of every sort of speculation that happens in this market in real estate is an inflationary situation. Um, yeah. And that's a problem. It, 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 We've seen in America now the, the consequences of that. And it's, it's really fascinating because I think there's no, you get economic growth along with it, but it's not like creating any new technology that's going to create like persistent growth. It's kind of, um, you know, it, you're, you're, you could invest in a VC company that like really innovates and everything, but it's, it kind of, you, you do make the property better, but you, you also, at scale, when you're like Blackstone or Colony, you kind of basically annihilate the middle class in, in some senses, correct? Yeah, I think so. And, and you bring up a good point, Tyler. Like, there's some forms of speculation that are actually deflationary. So, for example, like the speculation that came into the, the VC market post quantitative easing, I would argue was probably good for the mm -hmm. perspective of the standard of livings of America Americans. To the extent that these technologies are real, you know, like things like Uber and Zoom and whatnot, like they're actually positive forces for uh, the American, the, the average American family, because they are kind of reducing costs in, in some sense. And so it's not, quantitative transmission isn't always inflationary, but with real estate, it definitely is. There's no, yeah. there's no, I guess there's some positive in the terms of like what we provide to the market, for example, is quality adjusted, it's better. Mm -hmm. It's still more expensive, and I don't know what whether people really get the psychic benefit from the nicer granite and the nicer windows and the energy efficient appliances. It's hard to say whether it's it's actually better for them, um, mm -hmm. but it's certainly more expensive. Yeah, yeah. And can you go into the owner's equivalent rent part of CPI and kind of how that sort of disguises the inflation from a, a macro data standpoint? Yeah, this is a really interesting topic because now it's it's with what's the inflation narrative that we're seeing today. It's it's not something that the the powers that be can sort of hide from anymore. So my argument is that in the pre-COVID era, the way in which the BLS was calculating uh, CPI was dramatically understating inflation in the real estate market because they use this sort of backwards approach, in my opinion, a backwards approach where rather than trying to come up with a way to measure the actual on the ground pricing of apartments and houses, they, they came up with this survey um, where they, they survey households and they ask them to essentially estimate what they think their household would rent for unfurnished and without utilities. 
and the, the metric is called owner's equivalent rent. And to me, it's, I kind of get it, but then I think about like all the people that I know in my life, if I were to ask them that question, I don't think any of them would be, be anywhere near the right number for their house. Even people who are you know, highly intelligent, highly functioning, it's not, it's not so simple. You know, yeah. markets are nuanced and the pricing is nuanced. And so I think there's, there's something fundamentally wrong with that metric. And it missed. It, I mean, it absolutely missed. If you're, if you're living in San Francisco, New York, Seattle, L.A., 2010 to 2020, it missed it completely. And yeah. now what's interesting is that, that the inflationary pulses that we're seeing in our economy, they can't hide from them anymore because they are direct prices. It's like the price of lumber, the price of milk, the price of copper. And uh, I think, you know, behind closed doors, I imagine people are scrambling to try to construct a narrative to try to explain these away. You know, the, the transitory argument can only last for so long. We're a couple months into this now. I don't know how long transitory is, but we'll have to see. Yeah. I, I think they're going to hide behind the, you know, year over year adjustments. They'll still come down, but on an absolute basis, we're probably still going to be rising, you know, consistently. That's my read, but yeah. we'll see if it actually happens. Um, yeah. and, and talk about like with this inflation, what happens to real estate and like, what are you seeing in the market specifically in real estate right now? And how are you positioning? Yeah. So. Typically, inflation is, is sort of the friend of the real estate investor in a way. Like in, in some sense, like the entire premise of real estate investing is to take on a levered position in an asset, finance it with fixed rate debt that is lower than the cost of inflation. And so there's, there's, like, there's a sense in which there's a built-in financial alchemy to real estate investment if it's done intelligently, because you can, mm -hmm. you can play this game of borrowing less than inflation and achieving the benefits of leverage. And what's scaring me at this moment in time is that I'm a little bit worried that real estate across almost the entire spectrum, almost everything, might not be an effective inflation hedge going forward. Because we've we've had this sort of shadow inflation and we're, we're bumping up against another problem, which is the affordability problem because wages have been so far behind. So like we started notice, noticing this in the pre-COVID days in our Los Angeles portfolio where, you know, even if we were to provide a beautiful product, like a renovated product or a new construction product, there was like an, a ceiling to, to rents. And even if, even if you could, you know, raise the rents by whatever the city would allow you to raise them three or 5% or whatever, mm -hmm. the tenants would just revolt and go to someplace else if you try to pass that along to them. And so that was pre-COVID, and now it's even worse. You know, rents have probably even come down a little bit in Los Angeles. And what I'm noticing in Atlanta, which has been an absolute boom town, is that while you're still able to pass along uh, rental increases, the pace is absolutely slow. The pace is down from the pre-COVID days; it's down 50, 60 percent. And I suspect that Atlanta is reaching the point of Los Angeles. You know, 2018 is slowly getting to that point where there's just a limit to what you can charge. And then you start looking at other, okay, so that's rental, rental properties. You start looking at other assets, office. With the work from home, office is no pricing power, especially in America. Maybe in Asia where you can just sort of demand people to go back to work. But in America, office has no pricing power. It might not, there might not be like these massive defaults because the, these assets are still pretty good assets and most of them are well capitalized, but they're not raising rents. Definitely mm -hmm. not raising rents anytime soon. And, and retail is the same story. So there you go. I don't know what percentage of the commercial real estate market that accounts for, but it's a huge percent that basically, in my view, is questionable whether they have pricing power in the next you know, number of years without, a, without yeah. some kind of material change in the wage picture. And so you have on the cost side of things, all these inputs arising and no pricing, uh, I guess, sensitivity for, for rents rising. So the real, the real question is, do wages rise to create the the pricing, I guess, power for real estate owners, right? That's the big question mark that you're waiting for, for, for to come out. I, I think so. Yeah. You, to really know whether 
this hypothesis of mine is correct. We, we do need some time to go by to see what's going to happen with wages. And the wage thing is, is another interesting topic because another thing that I've been noticing is that COVID has, has really changed things in America. It's, it's not just about the, these decisions that people are making about where to live and you know, maybe preferring the more suburban lifestyle, but it's, it's also changing the way people are thinking about their jobs. And so like just this morning, the LA Times ran a story about how like there's this like nationwide like quitting phenomenon where like people are just like quitting their jobs, which is really fascinating because you, you make yeah. it through pandemic and then there's light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, and anecdotally, I, this is sort of confirmed by my friend set. Like I have a, a young guy who works with me at Metro's Capital and his um, girlfriend works at Facebook. And she said that she does advertisements for Instagram and she was telling me how her clients, these big companies, like they're having a hard time interfacing with them because they have so much turnover. Wow. So they're like, you don't even know who to talk to. They're just people yeah. are just quitting <laughs> mass. And uh, I've heard that from a few other people. So I don't know. Have you been hearing that? Yeah. You know what I'm thinking? And this is my experience. So maybe I'm just anecdotal. But when you work for a giant calcified organization that grows at, you know, 3% and you're a gen a zoomer or a millennial, you really don't have any upward mobility and you're getting eaten up by the, the inflation. If your wages aren't going up commensurately with the inflation of financial assets, like there's, it's really hard to stay in a career like with all the transcendental like technology changing. So I think what you're probably seeing is, people just saying, I'm, I'd rather go work at Blockworks or a small organization that's growing. And this is part of the generational ARB like whole theory is people will actually get paid. It's a meritocracy at, on a smaller scale, but it, it really is like a, a giant Ponzi scheme at these huge, huge organizations is, is what I think. But um, so I think the quitting is just like, there's really no upward mobility at these and it's kind of the Peter Thiel type thing where it's like the bigger you are, the less growth you have and you kind of slowly die. And that synopsizes a lot of like the boomer leadership um, for these corporations is they don't want to invest in, in new things. They want to financial engineer their earnings to go up. So I don't know, I'm not, I'm not too shocked about it. And also people want to feel like they're doing work that's valuable and I just don't think in an organization of 20,000 people or whatever it is, like, you know, if you work at JP Morgan and you're a middle manager, like how much alpha can you actually help for the bottom line? Like what, at that point, what are you really doing with your life? And I, not to devalue that at all. Like I know you have to put food on the table, but I think our generation has the ability to just relocate and, and lower your cost of living they want to work at those growing corporations, which is, and here's a question for you is like, you've seen a lot of the transition in living from the, the big, big cities like New York, San Francisco to smaller tier cities. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, th this is something that's been kind of going on for years, actually. In the pre COVID era, it was essentially, there was this, the beginnings of a, of a pretty consistent trend of out-migration of family-aged couples. So basically, you live in these cities until you start having children or you're contemplating having children, and then you're like looking around and, you know, in the extreme case at New York, when it's like $100,000 or something to go to a private school and it's uber competitive, like these other cities start to present a pretty compelling uh, case. It's not that difficult to say, okay, maybe I'll go to Nashville or Texas or something like that. And then, you know, when COVID hit, there was an immediate, uh, pretty massive move out of young people, like massive, like millions. I, I don't know the exact number, but the last time I looked at it, it was like a million and a half people is what they estimate. And we felt it in our portfolio. Um, we didn't feel it at all in Atlanta, interestingly, which is probably a beneficiary of, of the move outs of, of these other places because it's relatively low cost. Um, yep. And the, the young people are starting to move back, but I don't, I think if anything, COVID has accelerated the, 
the trajectory of these these generations like millennial to relocate from urban centers when they start having families. And you know, like LAUSD, for example, where I am at, is really struggling. Like their enrollment's down like 20%. And so even though California is reporting, California reported like a net outflow of 200,000 people in 2020, but yet enrollment at their public schools is down 20%. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty staggering statistic and it doesn't bode well for the future of a state. You know, you, you need young people. That's the whole point yeah. of, uh, of it. So it's kind of scary thinking about that. Another thing to bring up schools is like in these cities that where the inflation in, in, I guess, home prices and rentals is so high, like how do teachers get there? How do, you know, if you can't afford with like a teacher's salary, I guess it's like a diluted education, you know, if there's not like affordable housing, are you seeing anything yeah. in that realm? Definitely. Yeah. You know, j just recently, Austin Butner, who's the head of the LAUSD school system here, announced a program where LAUSD has a bunch of land. It's one of the biggest landowners in, in all of Los Angeles, and they are going to build affordable housing for teachers on their land because it's such a problem in the city. Like you, you can't yeah. find any more cheap to live. And so they're trying to address that exact point because they're struggling to retain their best teachers because yeah. teachers could relocate, you know, like I'm, my, my other, my wife's family is in Texas. We're going there in a couple of days and gosh, you could have an amazing lifestyle as a teacher in some of these mm -hmm. suburbs where in LA, you're going to live in like a bad apartment somewhere yeah, and, and have tough, a tough environment where like 20% of your students are homeless. Imagine that. Imagine fifth grade person homeless showing to school. Yeah. That's this something. Is a problem. Yeah. Jeez. I saw it in, in San Francisco. Like, there are people they commute like an hour and a half from outside of the city to be a teacher and like not only is yeah. that the cost of actually getting there but the the grueling nature of the lifestyle of commuting three hours a day is just like insane to me and then i noticed in austin because the affordability was better like a year ago yeah. uh, people actually can afford you know a nice lifestyle here and you all the service-based businesses or like being a teacher they're not alienated by the the housing inflation um but it's starting to get that way i think and, and maybe this is a good time to pivot into like what you're seeing from like the institutional perspective of stretching for yield and the dearth of housing supply um, because i think it's now not just hitting those main tier cities it's moving to the satellite cities that are pursuing the economic growth i think yeah. Yeah. I think this is a good, I, there was something that you mentioned too, that I wanted to follow up on and, I, and it's related to this question. So maybe I'll try to bring that up and answer your question at the same time. So go for it. Yeah. The, I know the premise for your, for your work, uh, for a lot of your work at Blockworks uh, recently that I've been reading, which is great stuff. Um, Thanks. I really enjoy it. And, and also the, you know, the name of this podcast, it's, it's related to this point, which is like, we are, we are having increasing debates about sort of the social contract between the generations. And, you know, taking it back to our conversation about people quitting, this sort of phenomenon of people quitting in the post-COVID era, it's almost like there was a social contract that our parents signed on for, like my parents signed on for, which was, listen, this is what the world was telling them. Work for us. We will take care of you. We'll pay you a decent wage. You'll have a good life. You'll have security. We'll take care of you in retirement. That was the fundamental social contract of sort of the boomer era. And millions of people signed up for it. And you can see it, these millions of people, you can see it in these massive pensions. That's what mm -hmm. these pensions are. Promises to pay this boomer generation for, for the, prom, the, the social contract. And these younger generations, which we're a part of, are looking at that social contract and they're like, gosh, I don't want, I don't want to be a part of that. Increasingly, they're saying, yeah. you know, this doesn't, this doesn't even sound like it's a fun situation, and it doesn't even sound like it's real. Like they're starting to question it. And anyone who looks at the mathematics behind the pensions, or even Social Security, or the big pension programs of state employees across the country, knows that it's, it's really like a questionable thing. And yeah. one, I wrote recently about. 
about this issue in, in my newsletter. And, and basically my argument was that because this is such a big issue between the generations, politics has turned into kind of a cold war because the younger generation can't sort of sit across the table from the boomers and be like, you know what? I know you guys are all in retirement now, but we can't pay you what you want and, and they take it away from them. The boomers are never going to let that happen. But it's a real problem for the younger generations because if you start to do the math, like take locally LAUSD and LAPD, they spend like 15% of their annual budget funding their pensions. And this yeah, is like and increasing this though, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like, all right, we need, the, we need services. We need teachers. We need police. But all this money, that's a huge number. 15% is like a really large number when you start to look at it. It's billions of dollars. And so it's a real problem. And so... The pensions themselves are in such bad shape and they're getting in worse shape every year that the low interest rate environment continues. Okay. And so we're seeing things manifest in my world, in the real estate world, which are a direct consequence of the low interest rate environment and the pressure that's being put on these pensions to produce returns. Because you can't buy sovereign debt. You can barely buy junk debt. It's very crazy. You know, I haven't, I don't follow junk debt very closely, but I don't think you can get much more than what, four or five percent? Yeah, I think the the yield just hit three point eight four yield to worst on the high yield uh, bond yeah. index. Yeah, so these all these pension funds need seven to break even. Like that's like their actuarial break even. So they need seven. So they're yeah. increasingly looking at other places. You know, and they they've been sucking the yield out of real estate since 2013, 14, Like I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and what's happening now is hit, is hitting the headlines. Is that there's sort of one asset class in America that you can still get a decent yield, which is this single family for rent product. So you mm -hmm. can still, and these are houses that are rather than sold to homeowners, they just rent them out. And you can still get in some cases like a six or a seven. And so they present like a really attractive proposition for a pension fund. But the problem is these, these institutions are so incentivized to put the money out that they're like, they're willing to overpay. So they like, there was this really high profile transaction in Houston where I think it was Blackstone went in and paid like 50% more than what these houses would have traded for if they sold to first time home buyers because they're just doing the math. You know, they're like, okay, well our yield just went from seven to six. Okay. No big deal. We still, this is still a good deal for us, um, yeah. but it really messes up the dynamics for homeowners and potential Absolutely. homeowners. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think there's the, that social backlash is slowly happening I, I don't, I don't know. It's hard to bet against like these giant, you know, oligarchs of capital, but I think they'll move. My, my guess is they'll move into Bitcoin and try to really utilize that as the next engine of, of future growth. But, you know, we don't have to go there. We can go there at the end because yeah. I think you really are causing that social issue. And not only that, the Fed is incentivizing it. They're buying, still buying 40 billion in, in bonds. We'll see at the next Fed meeting tomorrow. Um, you know, when this airs, it'll already happen. But uh, I think they'll probably like likely taper that Fed uh, mortgage-backed security buying. Yep. Yeah. It's, so it's, um, um, I agree. I think, I do think that here in Los Angeles, that the backlash is already affordability, homelessness is such a big issue that like you, the politicians can no longer ignore it and they, they're going to have to do some something to alleviate the pressure on, on households or they're going to get voted out of office. And so the attention is, I think that kind of attention is going to spread to the, the market, the housing market and the apartment market in general across the country. These cities that have experienced 20% house price appreciation over 12 months, they can only take like one more year of that before they're going to have like protests. Yeah. This is no you can't, you can't like sustain, it's not like the wages are going up anywhere close to that. We're like low single digits on the wages. So it doesn't take long before it's completely out of whack. Yeah. In terms I of feel like we're at yeah. some sort of turning point too. Can you yeah. talk about the pricing on some of these things? I know, you know, you've said you've been lightening up when the pricing on some of your properties, when the pricing gets insane, like what are the cap rates on these things? And can you explain what a cap rate is too for, for those non real estate investors? Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, we, we started selling probably too early. We started selling on um, these multifamily assets that we bought in 2012 and 13 in uh, 2016, because we were concerned that this, you know, the flood of liquidity was, 
was driving market behavior that was concerning. It was very speculative and prices like triple. So we're like, okay, that's a lot. Like maybe yeah. we should take some money off the table. Yeah. And we sold one recently. We, we had this suburban asset in the North Atlanta suburb that we bought in 2013. And we bought it. It basically didn't have a cap rate. Cap rate is essentially the operating income divided by the valuation or the price you paid. And it, it essentially gives you a sense of like, okay, what, what, what kind of return can I get if I invest in this asset on an unlevered basis? Mm -hmm. So if I put X dollars in it, can I earn a 5% return or depending on whatever the cap rate is. Mm -hmm. So we bought them with, the, with no cap rate because they were distressed. And a couple years into the cycle, they were trading at six or seven. So if you bought them, you could you could earn an unlevered return of six or seven percent, which is pretty good. You know, it's if you're a pension, that presents a pretty interesting proposition, especially when yeah. rates where they're at. We sold one just recently for like high threes. So this Sorry. is and if you if you think about what this asset is, this is a a property built in like 1980 with significant deferred maintenance. Like we didn't really invest that much in this property. So millions of dollars of deferred maintenance and some fund out of um, Mexico was like, Oh, that's a great deal. And they bid up like the brokers told us it was going to trade for like 40 million. And these guys bid 47 with no due diligence. Yeah. It, wow. it was really incredible dynamic. And that kind of cap rate, like you see that very often low cap rates like that, like three caps two. even in LA, you see two caps. But in Atlanta, you, man, that's just that's that's new. This is a very new phenomenon in a, in a secondary market like that. But it's a function and of it's happening from somebody outside the U.S. too, which is even more fascinating. It's like the stretch for yeah. yield is kind of global. I think it is, and and despite you know the the move that you know the dollar hasn't performed that well over the last couple of years, I, what I'm hearing on the real estate front is like people still from international jurisdictions, they absolutely want to get exposure to U U.S. real estate hmm. wow. because their currencies are even in worse position, you know, in the, yeah. in the macroeconomic world, uh, for the most part, you know, there, there might be some countries that are, are have compelling currencies, but we're, yeah. we're still seeing that. We're seeing that with the apartments in Atlanta and we're also seeing it with the ultra luxury stuff in uh, Los Angeles, housing and apartments. It's a lot of foreign buyers. Fascinating. So it's almost like this fiat, you know, Keynesian fiesta across, you know, global central banks, which is really just causing like a, a, a massive demand for assets. I think it's what it really is, is like the capital class figured out how to, you know, use debt in, in their printing presses and they slowly kind of squeeze the middle class every you know, single way they can in, in search for yield. And it causes, you know, all these imbalances. But I, th I think the inflation is here to stay. Can you talk about how, I guess, like, if this inflation is persistent, what kind of uh, damage it would do to like a fixed asset, like a bond or a kind of a real estate uh, property? Yeah, the in inflation is, is, it's basically the one thing that could destroy the system that, that that we're seeing today. Like it's the only threat that the central banks, they don't really have a, an answer for and they're absolutely petrified about it. And the reason is, is that historically we've learned that like there, there, you can defeat inflation, like whatever it is that causes inflation, I still, I still don't think people, we really know the answer to that, but when inflation does emerge in the world, you can beat it, but it requires a dramatic, dramatic, se severe move up in interest rates. Mm -hmm. And we've created this environment across the globe. This is not just an American problem. This is everywhere where we've built an economy and a, and a, a type of economic growth that's based upon high asset classes. And what happens if interest rates go up is that the entire system gets reset in terms of valuation because mm -hmm. the higher interest rate it means there's a higher discount rate to the way you're looking at your investment. So whether you own a stock or a bond or a piece of real estate, higher interest rates means that the prices are coming down. 
and it's I don't know if anyone has an answer you know like for how you could weave your way through this without causing a market correction I think that's what we're basically going to find out in the near yeah. future is like is there a way for the central bank to talk themselves out of this conundrum of, of rising interest rates causing the, the valuations of assets around the world to go down and they're I think that they're rightfully afraid you know the politicians and the central banks are rightfully afraid of what falling asset prices could do to this system because they really are so important uh, to, to the whole thing to the confidence to the spending yeah. it's like this house of cards and it, it's we're at this like this really scary moment um, yeah I don't, it feels I don't know like a fourth turning to me but yeah it, it, yeah exactly like Something COVID really unleashed something. I, I my theory is is that with, without COVID, we go on, and we end up like Japan, Europe, and the United yeah. States. And COVID comes in, and what it introduced into our economy is what our economy cannot handle, which is dynamism. And the dynamism of these decisions of moving and changing and quitting and all that is causing this inflation. Because the system wasn't prepared for it, so all these, you know, all, the, all these things that people are calling, you know, su supply chain anomalies, that's because they yeah. weren't prepared for this dynamic change in the demand structure of these of the economy, um, and, and it's it's worrisome for sure. I wish I had a good answer. So no, that was a great answer, um, and I think I, I think you're right on that. Um, so what are you looking at? What are your opportunities that you're looking at? I think you mentioned pre-builds and, and how, how does that affect kind of the capital versus labor and like what, what kind of world could we be moving into? Yeah. So one of the interesting things about kind of the world that you and I live in is that you, if you start spend a lot of time thinking about the macro stuff, you talk yourself into like, gosh, how do we get out of this? Like kind of like we just did, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it seems so it seems so difficult and basically impossible like gosh these governments and central banks are in in a real issue but then if you spend some time ignoring all that and looking at what's happening in innovation for example you you start to maybe construct a different view of the future and one area where we've been spending a lot of time in at metros is we've been in response to the price pressures that we saw pre-COVID, we were looking into modular manufacturing of, of apartment buildings. So essentially, this is where you build a you build a modular plant and you do all of the construction, or not all of it, a huge chunk of it, you do it inside of a facility instead of on-site. And the idea is, is that the production line nature of that activity can drive costs out of the, the process. And what's fascinating about it is like Gen 1, we, we're basically still in the Gen 1 of this. It actually, it does okay. It, it doesn't really produce like massive cost savings, but what it does do is it reduces the timeline for your project. So instead of taking 12 months to build something, it, the factory can do it in five months. But I had lunch with um, the CEO of uh, one of the bigger ones that's been funded by the venture capital community heavily. And he was telling me about their Gen 2 facility which is opening in, in uh, two quarters. And what they're, the, the technology that they're bringing online is like, it's, it's mind blowing and it's incredible and it's, it's gonna change things. You know, like other countries have been experimenting with these robotic uh, manufactured housing products for years, like Germany and Japan in particular. Mm -hmm. And they found that you can make a difference. And so this one company is forecasting that their framing labor costs is going to go to almost zero in their Gen 2 facility. Almost wow. zero. Yeah. yeah. That's Which insane. is crazy. Yeah. It's really crazy. And, and when you, as a real estate investor or a builder looking at the world, like you, you basically need that. At this moment in time, like you need one component like that to go to zero. Otherwise, it's, it's hard to make sense of these projects because of what we've seen with lumber and concrete and other building materials uh, in yeah. recent months. And so... It's going to, you know, these, I, I have a feeling that these facilities are really going to change the dynamic and there are opportunities. I, I, I think there's, I don't know if we're going to get to like this sort of fantasy singularity moment when like 
robots can build everything for, for nothing. But yeah. we're going in that direction. And it gives me hope that like these supply chain issues that have plagued the housing market and they could, uh, they could be resolved actually by technology. And that, yeah. that brings up another problem though, because we have one of the, the better sort of jobs for sort of uh, Americans who don't go the route of college and working for corporations is to work in the trades. And they've been under pressure for years and, and, and they're about to be under more pressure because- Yeah, that's a little the, scary. Yeah, the incentive structure for builders and developers and real estate players to to not use them and use these facilities instead is going to be really high. So I expect that that will become a political battleground relatively soon as well. Yeah. I, uh, I heard an anecdote from Kyle Bass this morning. He said, uh, nominal, uh, retail sales were at an all time high yet. We still have, you know, 8 million people, uh, unemployed from pre pandemic levels. And, what that kind of tells me is like we're like UBI is here in in some facet, and if you get like technology really annihilating, really you know, steadfast jobs that have been there for hundreds of years, that's going to be an increasing, I think, political battle, like you said, and we we, we could see more legislation kind of, and, and I think that will naturally be more inflationary um, if you you have more demand and not enough supply of, I guess, uh, goods, but we'll see what the technology does to the cost of it too. Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's deflationary in the sense that like maybe the cost of building an apartment will go down. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I work in, um, one of the things I do sort of to be, a, try to try to be a good public citizen here in Los Angeles is I've been working heavily on, uh, this bond measure that was passed in 2016 for homeless housing mm -hmm. and essentially LA voted to tax itself to allocate like a billion, $1.2 billion to build housing for the homeless permanent housing, not shelters. And so mm -hmm. I've been immersed in this world for five or six years now. And, you know, of course the cost just keeps going up and up and up. And there's a lot of reasons for it. Like when, when the program was initiated, everyone's like, okay, we could build these really nice studio apartments for 300,000 per unit. And now they're coming in at like five or 600. Oh man, you know, California. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's a lot of it is like self-inflicted, you know, like basically development in LA is like, like corrupt as all as, as possible. And oh, yeah. there's a million restrictions. These buildings are like, they're not net zero, but they're pretty close. And they yeah. have crazy ADA compliance that may or may not be needed. And so there's a lot of issues, but at the end of the day, like it's too expensive. 600,000, like the median home in America is 330,000. Yet here in LA, we can't build a homeless housing for 600,000 a unit. It's insane. It's, yeah. There needs to be something to work, whether it's technology yeah. or, yeah. Or labor. I, I always say that, you know, things don't change until the pain, you know, gets bad enough. And, you know, I think we're probably there at some place and there just needs to be some politician that gets in there and starts throwing elbows at people. But uh, yeah, we'll see who that person person. Yeah, is. I don't know who this is. Not Trump, but somebody like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, and then let's lastly let's just talk about. Uh, you have some thoughts on this. Is what I love is like you're a real estate investor, but also dabble in a little crypto. What are your thoughts on Bitcoin? And I know you wrote a great note about the metaverse too. That kind of changed my perspective. I thought it was kind of basically bullshit. And you kind of, at least with real data, showed me, um, you know, what, what it could be. So why don't you bestow that knowledge on us? Sure. Well, I'm glad to hear that uh, I, I was able to persuade you to think, see the opportunity in the metaverse. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So this whole conversation, actually, that we've been having leads, leads, us, all, leads us to the same place. It leads to, like, what do you do if, if the world looks like this and you, you're an investor or you're an American household and you're looking at a place to put your, your savings, what do you do? And increasingly, I've come to believe that cryptocurrency and the opportunities in the crypto world represents like a really smart place to, 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 to spend time in. You know, I do think there are problems with crypto, mainly like 
the the narrative that's developed around crypto is is kind of weird you know on twitter yeah there's like, some weird stuff going <laughs> on there I there's, a, there's a what's interesting to me is look i'm i'm 41 years old and like i'm watching people who are older than me engage on twitter like like children, children you know? yeah 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 i don't know where this stuff comes from it's like have some have fun staying poor i mean it makes me laugh <laughs> Maybe that's what it, maybe how that's how I should interpret it. But yeah, but these are real people who, in some cases, have been really successful. Mm-hmm. Anyway, my theory on that, by the way, just for the, maybe the the audience would be curious on that. Here's why I think we're seeing that. So there's there's a problem, and actually Ben Hunt kind of hinted at this in your discussion with him the other day. Mm-hmm. There's there's a problem with American culture, with the the sort of self selfish nature of 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 our system and our society like people seem to be just blindly pursuing their self-interest and and uh ben hunt goes far with it he, he basically is calling people sociopaths i think that's probably overstated a little bit and maybe he's doing that for effect um i've met you know i'm friends with a number of people in the, in the boomer world who've, who you know negotiated these pay packages that he's talked about and they're not sociopaths they're just like maybe not as concerned about their community as they should be. You know, they're, they're just getting what they can, you know? And so I don't, I don't necessarily yeah. diagnose them like that, but he's right. He's very, he's dead right about the problem. Yeah. To, to defend them to your point is like in a world of secular growth, like it doesn't really matter. Like you should be grabbing your piece of the pie if the pie is growing. And, and I get that. But when the pie is kind of like stagnating or shrinking, to kind of manufacture growth utilizing like central banks and debt, that's where I have the problem. If you're growing like Steve Jobs, man, you deserve every penny. But, that's right. You know, that's right. <laughs> you know, you're innovating by all means, but like I, I, I think it's when you're kind of stealing from one part of the pie. But keep going. I agree. Okay, so just to, to close the loop on uh, Ben Hunt, I really love his work. I've been following him for years, and he absolutely he's got the diagnosis right maybe overstated slightly. And his solution, I really love his solution. I, I've benefited so much from reaching out to my community and trying to give back and trying to be a force for good. And I believe that like that sort of decentralized approach is basically what's missing from American culture. And I've seen firsthand, like in Los Angeles, which is which is a crazy town, corrupt, you know, we got politicians going to jail. There's a couple thousand people who care about this place and who work without compensation and develop uh, social networks and try to do good. And, and so I, I'm really bullish on, on his, prog- his, um, his solution. And, and yeah, I think it's- I love one. that. Okay, so like, getting back to crypto. Mm-hmm. So crypto is a phenomenal opportunity. You have to be careful because the volatility is there, but it, it's probably the one, the one good place to hide out from the inflationary forces of society. Because, you know, my, my view on real estate is that real estate is actually, despite its historical track record of being an inflation hedge, is, is dangerous. It's dangerous at this moment. It might not be. And so what else do you got? Okay, you've got gold. That's probably okay. It'll, gold will probably do well in a, if we had, get a massive inflation. And then you have commodities. And commodities are probably primed to do well for a number of years. But they will die the same death that they always die, which is they'll have a huge run up which will spur a bunch of investment and they'll kill them, you know, they'll basically cannibalize their run. So you, you could temporarily benefit, for example, from a rise in base metals or something, but it's probably not going to be sustained. So, so yeah. that leaves cryptocurrency, which is kind of interesting because it's underowned. It presents a compelling alternative to earning, uh, having your money in the bank. The use cases for crypto in America are low, but that's not true other places. Mm-hmm. And imagine if you're in Venezuela or something like, gosh, I mean, crypto has a lot of use cases oh, yeah. that are really, really valuable. You know, like I, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday who has relatives in Colombia, and he was telling me that Venezuelans are coming over the border with like crypto keys and going to these crypto, these Bitcoin ATMs. That's how they're getting their cash to survive in Colombia. So that is a use case and you cannot deny it. That is a very powerful use case, especially yeah. in the world we live in where like not everyone has property rights like we do in America. Um, so I'm super bullish in general. And then um, 
the metaverse. I guess any other questions on that, and then we can get into the metaverse. Yeah, let's go. Let's go metaverse. Because uh, okay, uh, yeah, show, give me some data. Okay, so I got interested in the metaverse because as a real estate investor, you know, my colleagues and I at Metro is like part of our, our weekly or daily routine is like we get on the phone or meet at a coffee shop and we're like, okay, what's the market giving us? Like, what, what can we buy right now? And the answer is increasingly nothing. Like there's almost mm -hmm. nothing to do, right? Like cap rates are low everywhere. You can't even yeah. invest in these like tertiary markets. Uh, we're occasionally, you know, we're finding some stuff, but it's, it's really nothing. So mm -hmm. what do we do? We, so we got interested in crypto. We've been invested in it for years. And so we started to take seriously the idea that, okay, maybe there's something to these NFTs. And the research I did into the NFTs led me into the metaverse. And the metaverse is essentially video games. It's another way of saying a video game, but it's these 3D worlds that people are creating. And there's a few of them that are already kind of up and running. The most, I guess the first mover is probably Decentraland, which has its own yeah. token and stuff. But you, you, I created an avatar uh, in Decentraland the other day. You basically walk around and you interact with other players in the game, and it it could be fun. I mean, it, I'm a little like removed from that life, but I could see it. But what's fascinating about what's happening in Decentraland is that they're getting daily users in the thousands. You know, I think it's over ten thousand now, and they're getting commerce. They're getting yeah. internet type commerce. And so in Decentraland, for example, there's two casinos. One of them is, is co-sponsored by Atari. So you can like walk your avatar around. You can go play blackjack and then you can go to like this kiosk and play like an old Atari video game. Um, <laughs> that's yeah, that's mind-boggling. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm sure your wife, it, your wife loves you playing those. Yeah, she's like, yeah, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, and then in, in Decentraland, like Sotheby's, like two weeks ago, Sotheby's announced they're opening like a gallery. And what they're going to sell in this gallery are NFTs. And mm -hmm. that tells you something, right? Like the NFT sales that we're seeing, like there's actually something to them. Um, and then just recently, there's another developer who's a, who I think is basically an experienced video game developer is announced that they're opening a virtual mall inside of Decentraland. So essentially their idea is like, you could walk around with your character in any shopping environment and buy real goods that are linked to like amazon.com for example so it's basically taking the web you know the the web as we know it now and putting it into these virtual worlds and the, the same types of commerce that people engage in every day on the internet they're going they could do it in these games and yeah. it's happening yeah it, it the numbers once you start to think about the numbers it's it really is a staggering opportunity so i'll just give you one sort of nuanced example during COVID, the, the video game Fortnite, which is a really popular game, it has at any one moment in time, it has like 12 million users. It's incredible. Yeah. Right? Like, can't even imagine what it would take to get 12 million people in one physical space, right? Right. Compared to like a stadium, right? It's. Yeah, exactly. Like, how many times would you have to fill up the biggest stadium on earth to get to 12 million? Yeah. Um, they did these concerts with Travis Scott, they got 80 million participants. Yeah, that's real numbers. And that's where that's what got me. It's like that is a large number of people where you can monetize. If attention, the attention economy is real, you can sell it's ads and, and get that. Yeah. Yeah, you can sell ads, you could sell you know, in Decentraland too, like this one this one guy built some kind of club and they're doing a deal with this this club in Ibiza, a real club in Ibiza, where the DJs from that club are gonna play inside of Decentraland and like I guess you can go in there with your avatar and pay a ticket and participate. Man. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing, but I don't know exactly the right way to invest in this trend because I'm not like an authentic user. But some of these mm -hmm. ecosystems, like another one is popular. It's it's not really a virtual world. It looks more like a straight up video game. It's called Axie Infinity, and Axie Infinity is like a game where you have these characters that you can kind of level up, and people are paying like hundreds of thousands of dollars for leveled up versions so like young entrepreneurs can go on the game level up a creature yeah. and sell it to somebody else to go play on Man. to play in the game yeah it's yeah it's crazy. a whole new world i watched ready whole player one last night and it seems closer and closer than we think yeah that's exactly the point that that's what the metaverse is is like um i think there's something to it like 
I think that people are going to gravitate towards digital experiences that are more robust than the 2D version, which is like logging onto websites and things like that. And so I, I can see it once, once these lands develop to the point where they're like easy to use and whatnot, I think that there'll be billions of people on it. I mean, what is Facebook? How many users does Facebook have? Like 2 billion? Like, okay. Yeah. Every one of those people could be a, uh, could have an avatar in a virtual world and be buying yep. stuff. Yeah. I can see it's, it. We'll just see crazy. if the Fed raises rates before then. You know, if the inflation yeah. gets bad enough and cuts it off. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, Nick, this is, this is an absolute pleasure, man. Um, hopefully uh, we can do this again in a couple of months and, and recheck uh, the impulses on the, the housing market. Yeah, I would, I would love to. Um, thanks for having me on. As always, man, I really enjoyed this conversation. Appreciate it. Take care.